as a weapons inspector, maybe you could uh, speak more on this article in the Wall Street Journal talking about how Russia has uh, used uh, electronic warfare to basically jam up uh, many of Ukraine's systems, uh, advanced, uh, so supposedly high-tech weaponry provided by NATO. Here you have the Wall Street Journal saying, wait a minute, and this is something a lot of people have been talking about uh, outside of the mainstream media, but how these weapon systems just have not been able to overcome Russia's capabilities. So could you talk about this electronic warfare and, and maybe your experience uh, uh, regarding uh, what Russia is doing and, and at, from a weapons uh, inspector perspective? Sure. You know, back in uh, 1988, 89, um, I was a weapons inspector going into the Soviet Union. And we built a facility, we being the United States, <laughs> Uh, Defense Nuclear Agency in cooperation with Sandia National Labs, I uh, went to Kirtland Air Force Base and built something called the Technical On-Site Inspection uh, Facility, where we um, where we tested out the various monitoring equipment that we would be using in the Soviet Union, the giant cargo scan x-ray facility, the uh, data collection center, uh, the various you know devices to control rail traffic, et cetera. Um, and right next to it, because you know Kirtland does a lot of testing. They have aircraft there as well, home to a number of things. But um, as you drove into the TOSI facility, uh, there was this giant array of like antennas, it looked like, but just this giant cage. And um, you come in there and every once in a while, there'd be an aircraft sort of suspended in there. And I'm like, what's that? Well, that's the, um, that's the EMP, uh, test that's the electronic warfare the test basically we were building aircraft we were building systems that were designed to survive jamming uh electronic ma electromagnetic impulses uh things of that nature um we were very worried about electronic warfare um everything we did when i was in the marine corps um was based upon the premise that the enemy's jamming us intercepting us etc we we trained in a very realistic environment. We spent a lot of money doing it. Um, the Cold War ended, and the necessity for continuous is very expensive training and stuff went away. 9-11 came, and we found ourselves at war in Afghanistan and in Iraq against an enemy that wasn't very sophisticated when it came to electronic warfare. And because, you know, defense spending being what it is, you tend to spend on that which you need at the moment and you spend you don't spend on those things that are no longer relevant. And electronic warfare, uh, aggressive electronic warfare became irrelevant. We just stopped doing it, literally. I mean, it just, just wasn't part of our, our repertoire. Uh, meanwhile, the Russians are always been focused on electronic warfare and when looking at their potential adversaries, especially NATO and the United States, once NATO expansion took place, the Russians, you know, began preparing actively, integrating a very aggressive electronic warfare postures into their force structure and to their operations, their tactics, etc. Um, the, so the Russians are, are 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 key to think this way. So you know, when when the United States, for instance, introduced the JDAMs. Um, <laughs> the joint direct munition system, joint direct attack munition system. I think that's what JDAM stands for. Basically, it's a bomb that has a guidance system put on the top, a GPS guidance system, and then the ability to, to make alterations in course. So as the, the, the aircraft above, We'll put in where it wants to hit below. Usually you have somebody on the ground observing, saying that's what we want to hit. Uh, they calculate, they get the, the they get the precise point there, they pass it up the airplane that knows where it is, so it can input where it is, where it wants to go, release the bomb, and then the bomb guides in and hits exactly where it wants to go. Man, this thing was wonderful in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, you got these JTACs, Joint Tactical Air Controllers out there, calling in airstrikes and it's like magic. The B-52 appears overhead and pop, 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 out come the JDAMs and bam, 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 enemies being blown up. And man, we are the best in the world. No one can stand up against us. Except the Russians who 
are watching all this going, hey, uh, what's the vulnerability of that system as it comes down? It's uh, It needs linkage to a satellite. What if we jam it? What happens if the satellite linkage is broken and the bomb goes stupid? Now it's not going to hit its target. It's going to launch it. It's just going to go someplace. And uh, so the Russians have been looking at it. And when we provided them to the Ukrainians, the, you know, the Russians have are prepared to collect all the data as things come in. They collect the debris. They're tracking. They're intercepting signals. And it all goes back to dedicated defense industrial facilities that sit there and say, okay, here's a jammer. This will jam that. Today, the JDAM doesn't work in Ukraine because the Russians have jammed it. Hi, Mars. You know, we fire it off a couple times. It's got both an inertial guidance system, but a GPS guidance system. You fire off enough rockets, enough debris is going to be collected where the Russians are going to be able to reverse engineer. There's always that dud that fires out there and goes stupid and ends up on the ground nearly intact. And the Russians take that off and they do the evaluation and they come up with jamming units. So when you start popping off high Mars, they just start going where they're not supposed to go because they've been jammed. Um, you know, th th this is what the Russians do. Uh, they've been very good at they. You know, we we had the Excalibur round. I mean, the artillery again because we developed all these weapons in twenty years of fighting Afghans and Iraqis, insurgents. You know, and so this is just magic technology in those situations. Boom, Excalibur guy, laser designating, or it's a you know GPS, and it comes in and hits perfectly. But then the Russians have built the jamming unit. We fire the Excalibur, and it just goes stupid because the Russians have jammed the signal. Um, this is the reality of just about every weapon. Attackums. The Russians now have broken the code on attackums, and they can jam it too. Um, this is this is this is the reality of modern warfare. The Russians have got us beat hands down, and we haven't spent the money necessary to build the systems that can overcome Russian jamming. It takes a long time, a lot of money, a lot of lead time. We're still convinced that what we produce is the best in the world. It has to be. It's made in America. It's made in Europe. I mean, it's good stuff. It's not that good. Really not, because it's not been tested in the in the real battlefield. And what we see right now, the real battlefields in Ukraine, and these systems aren't succeeding. They're failing. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't lethality. Of course, HIMARS is killing some Russians. I mean, you know, you can't you can't jam everything all the time. Some things hit their targets. Tacums do get through, uh, but the Russians are shooting down the vast majority of this stuff. The the weapons we're providing Ukraine are not having the impact on the battlefield that um, that we thought they would. And the other thing about them is they're very expensive. Uh, so you know, we we've been giving the Ukrainians a lot of money, big dollar figures, but. Understand that when you take big dollars and you have very expensive systems, that you're not buying as many of those systems as you as you could be if they were cheaper. And if the Russians are jamming them, that means you just nullified a big chunk of that money. So if you've got a hundred billion dollars and you've dedicated, you know, fifty-five billion of that to advanced munitions that have been nullified, you're really only getting forty-five billion dollars. That's still a lot of money, but it ain't a hundred. Um, this is this is the reality. The other thing that's come out is that you know not only has NATO not been prepared for this fight, but they're never going to be prepared for this fight. There's a lot of talk about the need to expand NATO, expand NATO uh, defense industry, et cetera. One of the things we found out at the summit is that NATO's been lying about artillery production rates. You know, we produced over a million rounds. We did that. Eh, turns out, no, you didn't. You produced about half a million rounds. Uh, not enough. Uh, so they lied. Uh, and, they, and then the other thing is, it's not like we lied because we're waiting to build up. They can't do it. <laughs> they can't expand their, their industrial base. They just don't have the money. The Germans, biggest economy in Europe, um, supposed to be the leader in terms of this modernization. Olaf Scholz dedicated 100 billion euros to rebuilding the German army. That money runs out in 2027, and he hasn't done a damn thing. Excuse my language. I mean, they have 100 billion quickly goes when you're talking about expensive Western systems that don't work. Um, but they can't. They haven't retooled defense industry. They don't have expanded factories, expanded production. Um, he turned to his, you know, to the German parliament and said, you know, in 2027, this 100 billion runs out. We have to have a defense budget that's capable of picking up, you know, uh, continuing the momentum created by this 100 billion. And what did the parliament do? He asked for 
a six billion euro increase in the defense budget, they gave them one point two billion. That doesn't even meet meet inflation. So that means that Germany's defense expenditures are actually shrinking. Germany the, in the coming fiscal year will be spending less effective um, money on defense than they did last year, getting weaker, not stronger. And that holds true for all of Europe. France passed a 419 billion euro five-year defense budget last year that's supposed to, you know, double def French defense spending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Except they now have political deadlock. Uh, the parliament ain't going to support that. There's other priorities in France other than spending all this money, especially when that money was geared to get France ready to fight a war with Russia that many in France no longer believe France should be getting ready to fight. So the French have been known. The British are the funniest ones of all because they talk big. I mean, my God, Keir Starmer's out there just thumping his chest like he's Superman. I'm going to save the world. And We're the doing media, the, what The media all, as he was traveling to the summit, they made it seem like Superman was literally flying. Oh, he is. I mean, he's Keir, Keir Starmer, former MI5 head, man. This guy is just, he's good. And he's got Healy now, the defense secretary, and he's good too. And they're going to do a root to stem analysis of what it takes to get UK defense spending increased to 2.5% GDP by 2030. You realize what a joke this is? By 2030? The war is right now. The war is today. And the UK is sitting there trying to come up with a plan to get defense expenditures increased by 2030. And then Starmer had to, you know, put a little caveat on it. If the economy will support it, but the economy won't support it. This is the reality of British defense. It's shrinking. It is the, the, the greatest shrinking military in modern history. You know, a couple of years ago, they could put 72,000 British soldiers in a stadium. That's it. That's all they had. Uh, they can't even fill up a, a big soccer stadium. It'd be about 20,000 unsold seats. Today, I think the numbers, you know, it's getting ready to drop down to, you know, 58,000, 54,000. Um, they can't afford it. They can't recruit. They can't. They're going to have to retire the aircraft carriers because they don't have sailors for them. Uh, they have frigates. They bought a new category of frigates. They can't put them all at sea because they don't have enough sailors, not enough recruits. Nobody wants to join. Their Air Force is a joke. Everything about them is a joke. They're, but we're supposed to believe that NATO is going to be this expansive unit capable of sustained. But there's not a single military in NATO today that could go to Ukraine and survive more than a couple of weeks. Not even the United States. We don't have the sustainability. General Christopher Cavoli has acknowledged that. And the other thing, NATO is like, uh, we're getting stronger. No, I just told you you're getting weaker. The German military literally got weaker this year because 1.2 billion increase in defense spending doesn't meet inflation. Meanwhile, the economy has shrunk. You can't produce the tanks you claim you need. Rhine metals out there. We want to do this, that, and the other thing. With what steel? The foundries are shut because of the gas. You can't afford the gas to, to keep the foundries operating. Where are you going to get your steel? China? You know, so um, it, it, Europe's a joke. NATO's a joke. This entire summit is a joke, except for the stupidity of trying to flex as if they're somehow right there. This is where Russian patience comes in. I know there's a lot of people out there that are frustrated saying Russia doesn't need to put up with this. Russia wins every day by doing what it's doing. Russia doesn't need to expand. Russia doesn't need to, you know, respond. Russia's winning. Ukraine. I mean, what did the statement say? The NATO statement? Um, it's inevitable. Ukraine will be a member of NATO. It's inevitable. <laughs> Irreversible was also Irreversible. interesting. What's uh, interesting about that word is um, it's hard to reverse something that literally has not happened. So something <laughs> that's irreversible, <laughs> it's not even... It's not even in motion, so to reverse it uh, anyway, that's yeah. Blinken won't even talk about a a bridge. You know, some people call it a bridge. <laughs> Blinken won't even do that. We're just saying that it's there, that the door has uh, been opened, and uh, Ukraine will be a member. But mm, when? Well, we can't really say when because the real answer is Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. You, I love what you just said. You can't reverse something that doesn't exist. And Ukrainian membership doesn't exist. It, it can't exist. Ukraine is an inherently corrupt entity. Ukraine's not going to be around. They're talking about five years. I mean, people say Ukraine first has to win this war. They're not going to. They're not going to win. 
one of the conditions of conflict termination will be Ukraine signing a treaty that says it will be neutral in perpetuity. This is a real perpetuity, not Finnish perpetuity. Um, you know, because the Finns signed a treaty like that, you know, at the end of World War II with the Soviet Union, saying they will be neutral forever, never allow foreign troops on from now they're a member of NATO and, you know, talking about opening up 12 to 15 bases. Um, but, you know, Ukraine will, there will be a treaty that requires Ukrainian neutrality. And um, that's the reality of it. So Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. That's an absolute guarantee. But the, the NATO it can't be honest enough to say that. And the sad thing is they're going to sacrifice, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of more Ukrainian lives before this, this reality, you know, reaches fruition.